Shalom, and welcome to another class of biblical history. We are tracing the stories of King David and his troubles. Uh, if we recall, uh, the sin that he had with Bathsheba in uh, chapter 11 caused him to uh, have a succession of <clears throat> um, problems uh, with his family, uh, one son raping his daughter, um, his son being killed by another son, Avshalom, and Avshalom runs away. Uh, son, David and Melech, King David, didn't see Avshalom for several years until he finally brought him back to Jerusalem to kind of make peace, but it was a very cold peace. And as a result, uh, Avshalom got the message that he's no longer welcome in the house of, uh, of David. But Avshalom had bigger things on his mind. He wanted to become the king. And in fact, he goes to Hebron, where his father had uh, declared himself king, and Avshalom declares himself king. Not only that, but he comes back with a big army to Jerusalem to attack uh, his father. Very sad. And um, the events uh, are, uh, are tragic. Um, David, who hears that Avshalom is coming to attack, Instead of fighting, and he had a formidable army, but he decides to run away. So he runs away and he goes east towards the, uh, the, uh, the Malaise team, the Mount of Olives. And he sent different uh, members of his, uh, um, of his cabinet back to Jerusalem. Some he sent undercover, some he sent... Um, just to go with the Ark. He didn't want them to be um, affected by what's going to take place, which is basically Absalom's going to uh, run after the king and try to kill him. Because you understand that if you are becoming the, uh, the new king, you can't have the old king still hanging around. So David is making his way um, through the, uh, in the end of chapter 15, uh, Hushai, David sends Hushai back to Jerusalem um, and he sends Achimatz and Sadok and Yonatan back to Jerusalem. And um, now David in, in chapter 16 is uh, making his way to, uh, to the summit of the mountain of Olives and on his way down to the Dead Sea. <clears throat> and he sees Tziva. Siva is the servant of Mephibosheth. If you remember, Mephibosheth was the grandson of King Saul. So um, Siva is coming to King David, and he has with him a whole bunch of food. I mean, loaves of bread, 100 loaves of bread, and 100 cakes of raisin, jars of wine. Didn't understand what's going on. So he says to Siva, what are these? And he says, your, your, your people must be, must be tired. So he's doing a chesed. Once again, we have to remember that King David was a, a righteous king for all these years. And he had a big following. And he had plenty of people who, who loved him. And therefore, um, Tziva was one of them, despite the fact that he, uh, he was part of the, really, the, uh, the camp of uh, King Saul. And his father, Mephibosheth, was against David. So David said in verse 3, where is your master? Right? So he said he's staying in Jerusalem because he thinks that the house of Israel will now give him back to the throne of his grandfather. In other words, if uh, Mephibosheth thinks that he has a chance to, uh, you know, King David is, uh, is, is ousted. So now he has a chance to get back to the, to the uh, monarchy. Um, he's basically relinquishing his uh, connection to David. And David therefore says, okay, if that's the case, kol asher l'cha l'mithiboshet, uh, l'cha. In other words, everything uh, I, I swear that all that I was, that was going to be owned by Mephiboshet is going to be yours. The slave is going to inherit the master because he chose to stay with David. David gets to a place called Bahurim. And um, here a very tragic story takes place. Someone from the house of Saul, and if you remember, I guess the wounds are still uh, open, 
in terms of the house of Saul, even though Saul died and Jonathan died and uh, Ishbosheth died and uh, and um, and Avner died. Nevertheless, there are still members of the uh, the previous kingdom that are upset, upset with King David particularly. And one such member was a man named Shimi ben Gera. Shimi ben Gera was uh, started cursing David. Now you have to imagine that there's a, a valley, and on the on the sides of the mountains there are you know people watching this uh, incredible display of King David, King of Israel, you know making his way, running away from his uh, from his uh, fortress, from his palace. Um, and running into the desert. And one such person is Shimi ben Gera, who is uh, cursing at David and throwing stones at him. And, um, and basically everyone was, uh, he was causing everyone to make fun of him. He threw stones at David and all of David's uh, servants that were with him. Um, and this is what, what uh, Shimi ben Gera was saying, leave, leave, you man of murder, you, you criminal, you villain. And he said, God is going to repay you, is repaying you now for all the blood that you shed in the house of Saul. And if we remember, I mean, that's not exactly what happened at all. He was trying his hardest to, uh, to be respectful of the king and of all of his courtiers. But uh, nevertheless, Shimi ben Gera says, um, makes fun of him, throws rocks at him, curses him, and says, um, you are a, um, a man of murder, and that's why your son is taking over for you. Now, who's with King David? Abishai ben Surya. Remember, there are these amazing warriors, Abishai and Yoav, right? They're still with King David. So Abishai talks up and says, why should this dead dog curse my Lord? Let me go and cut off his head. And David responds, Ma'li v'lachem b'nei tzuriya, ki yikalel v'chi Hashem amar lo kilel David, umi amar madua asita kem. He kind of accepts his fate. He says, this is the will of God. He understands that he's being punished. He was being punished by Amnon. He's being punished with Tamar. He's being punished with, with Avshalom. And now he's being punished by being kicked out of his home. And um, remember that uh, they were saying, the, the prophet said that he's going to be paid four times for what he has done if he caused someone's death. So he's going to be four of his sons are going to die. The first son that, he, that, that died was the son of the union between David and uh, Bathsheba, who died as a, as a baby. Then Amnon, then Tamar. Now we wonder about Avshalom. So he lets the, he, he allows himself to be cursed by Shimi ben Gera um, the entire time, but he doesn't forget. David says to Abishai and all of the people with him, if my son seeks to kill me, how much more so this Benjaminite? You know, if my own son wants to kill me, so obviously the people from the house of King Saul want to kill me as well. Maybe God will see this and um, this will be like a penance for my, for my actions and, and I'll hopefully receive... Um, I'll hopefully, you know, finally cleansed. David goes, uh, continues walking, and Shimi continues walking on the side of the mountain, uh, cursing him and throwing stones at him and flinging dirt at him, the king of Israel. Um, the king come exhausted, you know, they're running away. Meanwhile, Avshalom at the same time, he comes to Jerusalem with all the grandeur and all the people and they're cheering him on and he goes into the, the palace and Achitophel, remember Achitophel, he was this wise man who, you know, was on the side of David until he switched sides and now he's giving advice to Avshalom. And who does, so it's them two and a whole bunch of people and who do they meet? They meet Hushai Ha'arki. Remember, he's the guy that David sent to uh, 
to be a double agent, okay? So they meet Hushai the Arki, and Hushai says to Ashlom, Yechi HaMelech, Yechi he, Hail the King, you know? Hail the King. Long live the King, Avshalom. And Avshalom knows that Hushai was a close friend of his father, and he says, why didn't you go to your friend? Why didn't you go to, with David? And Hushai says to Avshalom, and maybe he's convincing, maybe he's not. He says, I see that God has chosen you. And therefore, with you, I will stay. And after all, he says, who else should I serve other than the son of the king whom I served? So I served the, the king. It was God's choice. Now it's no longer God's choice that, that, that David is the king. And therefore, I will serve his son. So Avshalom says to Achitofel, remember Achitofel is this wise oracle, right? wise man, and he says to him, Nu, tell me what to do. So Achitofel says to Avshalom, go and sleep with the concubines of your father. And that is a statement that you're making basically says, saying, um, you know, my father's reign has come to an end. And now I am the new David, you know, I'm taking over. Um, that's exactly what happened. Um, Avshalom makes this, you know, huge gesture by, remember David left his concubines in the palace and now they're being slept one by one by Avshalom in front of all of Israel. And the, the, the Navi ends, the chapter ends with saying that the, the, the advice of Achitofo was accepted as if it was like a word of God. That was how the advice of Achitofa was accepted by David, and now it's how it's accepted by Absalom. Chapter 17, Achitofa says to Absalom, let me take 12,000 men, run after David, and I'll kill him tonight. That'll be, that'll be the end of it. I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come up to, to him. He'll be very tired because he's running all, you know, and I'll throw him into a panic and all the tr tr troops will flee and I'll kill the king alone. And then I'll come back and then it'll be, there'll be peace. And the, this advice pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. We have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of man Absalom is that he's taking, you know, Lee in killing his father. Now we understand that, you know, this is how life was with kings and throughout history and children who want to uh, root out their fathers and murder their families and all these kind of things, but David's own son. We have to see this as a, uh, a divine design. You know, this is what God is making happen. Um, now, Absalom, who was loved by David, and David would never want to kill him. Nevertheless, there's no problem saying to uh, Achitofo, yeah, yeah, go kill him. Terrible. Now, Absalom says, you know what, you go, but also I want to hear what Hushai Ha'arki has to say. Now, this is weird why um, Absalom wouldn't accept Achitofo's advice after all. You know, you have the, the greatest, wisest man in the, in the world or in the country or whatever it is. And then Absalom, the king says, oh, but I also want to hear from this guy, Hushai, who doesn't have a, that, that kind of pedigree. So why is, um, why is Absalom seeking secondary advice? It's a slap in the face to Achitofa. And everyone sees this. We'll get back to Achitofel. Uh, and the answer, according to Chazal, according to the rabbis, is that this is God's interference, intervention into uh, the story. Anyway, Hushai, who obviously wants to protect David's interests, says the following. The advice that this time, the advice that Achitofel gave was not good. He's obviously lying. It would have been the end to, to David. But he says, no, no good. Why? You know, your father has, his men are courageous. Remember, they're still great fighters and they're desperate as a bear uh, that's being robbed of her, uh, you know, whelps her, her young children. Uh, and your father is a, uh, is a man of war. 
And he's not going to spend the night with the troops. So even if Achitofel goes and he's going to, he's not going to be able to find him. He's going to be out hiding. He's probably hiding in one of the pits. Um, and any of them fall, uh, you know, and, and if there's an attack, they'll say, uh, oh, you know, uh, a terrible thing happened to, to those troops that follow Ab Absalom. And if he's a brave man with the heart of a lion, he'll be shaken for all Israel knows that your father and the soldiers are courageous fighters. For after all, I have been giving him advice from Dan to Beersheba, the whole breadth length of Israel, um, to be called to, up to join you and then of yourself march into battle. When we come uh, upon him in whatever place he may be, we'll descend upon him and uh, then we'll be able to take him. So, so basically, Hushai, uh, you know, uh, um, Achitofel says, let me take a small group and do it quickly in the stealth of night and we'll go and kill um, David right now. And Hushai manages to delay it by saying, oh, he's such a great warrior and he won't really be there. Instead, let me take a whole big army and we'll go in a different direction and, uh, and we'll get to David and then don't worry, we'll take him. Uh, they'll bring ropes and they'll drag at stones and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll destroy a whole city. Now, Shalom says, and once again, this is willed by God, um, the advice of Hushai Ha'arki is greater than the advice of Achitofel. And now the Navi itself says, and God commanded to, to destroy, to nullify, ruin the advice of, the good advice of Achitofel in order to, uh, to harm Avshalom. This is God intervening through the, uh, you know, the choice of uh, advice that's accepted. And therefore, um, uh, David is going to be saved. Uh, you can imagine Nachitofa when he hears that his advice is not taken. What's he going to do? Anyway, first thing Achushai does, because he's planning a big army and he's going to, you know, but at the same time, quietly, he goes to Tzadok and Aviatar, the Kohanim. Remember, they were also sent back. And he said, this, this was Achitofel's advice, but I advise something different. So now here's what you should do. Send to David and to tell him not to spend uh, time in the wilderness, but really to cross over the Jordan and to be safe that way because he was concerned that Achitofel wasn't going to listen to the king. He was going to go kill David anyway. So... Um, Yehonatan and Achimatz, who were staying at a place called Ein Rogel. And um, a slave girl would go and bring them word and tell them to go and inform King David about what's happening. Now, Yehonatan and Achimatz also, right? They were Tzadok and Eviatar, they were Kohanim, they stayed. Yehonatan and Achimatz, David sent back but they were on the, uh, on the way or somewhere in the middle. And they were also considered um, to be on David's side. And therefore they couldn't go and tell David. So they did it through um, a, uh, a slave girl. Nevertheless, a voice saw them and informed Absalom. And when they, they, they understood that they were in trouble because uh, someone saw them trying to give information um, so they, uh, they were going to be killed. So the woman saved their lives by um, putting them in the pit and you know, scattering some things over it in order that uh, they not be killed. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, the servants of Avshalom who heard that uh, these two guys were coming to, uh, to try to give, uh, you know, to spy for David. They looked, they didn't find them. They returned to Jerusalem and, and they uh, uh, obviously were saved. Reminds us of what happened when the spies went to Jericho and Rahab saved them, right? So here too, um, they, they were gone. Achimaz and Jonathan came up from the well and went and informed King David. And they said to him, you better cross the Jordan quickly for Achitofel advise you this and this that's going to happen. What does it mean to cross the Jordan? Here's a picture and this on the right here, of the rebellion of Absalom. Now, if you look at this blue line, this is the Jordan River. 
Okay, and here's the Dead Sea, right? And here's Beit Shan. So, and here is Jerusalem. Hebron, Absalom comes in the green to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the red line, is David flees and he goes up over Mount of Olives down into the Dead Sea area at the tip and then goes a little north to a place called Gilgal, where you know it's a famous place. And that's where he's told to continue and cross over the river and find shelter in the forest of Ephraim to wait for further plans, okay? So um, that's what happens. David, verse 22, crosses the Jordan River in the morning. By daybreak, there was no one left. In other words, he scanned, he, he got away very quickly and he was saved. So because of Hushai's advice and because of Yonatan and Achimat and because of all these events, God is protecting David. Let's think about this. God is protecting David from being killed by his son. Why, if we said that David was such a terrible person, then why is God protecting him? Why is God intervening and making sure that David um, stays alive? And not only stays alive, but he's gonna come back to power. The answer is like we've discussed in previous lectures that David had a momentary lapse of judgment and did some terrible things, not the worst, most terrible that we normally think of, but terrible things had to be punished for, but his life, his entire picture, his existence, if you put him on a scale, all the good things that he's done and those terrible things that he's done, it far outweighs, the good outweighs the bad and therefore he deserves to be given uh, a second chance. Achitofel, however, look what he does. He saw that his advice was not accepted saddles his donkey, goes home to his house, says goodbye to his family, and commits suicide. That's intense. I guess when he realized, according to the commentaries, he realized that he was obviously gonna be killed, right? That um, his plan was foiled. Absalom is going to be killed. David is going to return. And obviously they're going, the first thing we're going to do is going to search for Achitofel's head. And if uh, it'd be better for him to kill himself now and his family is taken care of because he like takes, you know, sets his affairs in order. And lo and behold, um, Achitofel just kills himself. Interesting piece of trivia about the very few people kill themselves in the Tanakh. David comes to a place called Machanaim. Avshalom crosses the Jordan running after him with all of Israel. Amasa, Avshalom turns Amasa into his uh, chief general. His Amasa, the son of Yeter. And um, they get ready for a big battle in verse, in verse 26 um, in, in the Menashe, like we saw in that picture on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, and David comes to Machanaim, and once again, David had made many friends, not only from the Israelite camp, but Shovi, the son of Nachash, from Rabat ben Amon, and Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lo Daber, it's another place, and Barzel, Barzilai, Agiladi, they brought out couches and basin, earthenware, wheat and barley, and grain and lentils and grain, and honey, and uh, they say, your army, must be tired and weary, so we're going to take care of you. Once again, showing that David was was appreciated and loved throughout the kingdom, um, and you know this is a think something between Absalom and uh, and his father. Chapter eighteen, get ready for the battle. <laughs> David um, turns into a general once again. He gets the troops ready. He appoints the, the captains and he appoints the, the different uh, um, platoons and units, etc. And he sent David sends a third in, in, with with Yoav his his general and a third with Abishai his brother and a third with Itai, 
the Giti, and he's ready to do battle. And he says, and I'm coming into battle. And they all said, no, 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 you're not coming. You're not coming, David. You know, was, the, the battle is really not a battle of, it's a civil war. It's not a battle that Jews against Jews. It's a battle to kill David. And therefore, if you're there, it's, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to function. The whole, the whole battle is going to be focused on, on you. And uh, we're not going to be able to uh, d- deal with them handily. Rather, you stay where you are. And we will be able to control this battle. So the king says, uh, okay, you guys, uh, I trust you guys. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll stay back. Okay, this is a little different than the King David of, you know, the sin of King David when he decided to stay back anyway. Here he wants to go into battle. And when David wants to battle, that's the type of king that you're looking for. Um, He commands Yoav and Abishai and Itai the following. He says, listen, you go and do as much battle as you want. But when it comes to my son, they were called kid gloves, which means don't hurt him. Deal with him lightly, deal with him gently. After all, yes, your son wants to kill you, but you don't, uh, you don't go and kill the king's son. That's what David said. This is the same David who says, you don't kill Saul who, uh, who wants to kill him. And he, uh, he's the kind of personality that, uh, yes, people want to kill me, but I'm not gonna go and kill them. Certainly it's not in my own family. Battle takes place in the place called Yar Ephraim. And David's army defeats Absalom's army, 20,000 men. In fact, um, men were killed in the, in the forest. Um, they said even more than the sword, the forest took maybe the animals of the forest, the beasts. It was basically a massacre. Absalom uh, uh, comes before, you know, he's, he's been caught. And he's riding on a mule. I'm not sure why he was riding on a mule in the battle, but in any case, in any way, he gets entangled. His hair gets entangled under a terebinth tree. And believe it or not, he is suspended by the tree. You know, as he's running away, he's marching, you know, he's riding away and all of a sudden his hair, remember we talked about his great lock. So his hair got entangled in a tree and he's, He's suspended in the tree. Can you imagine? So they finally find the, the, the enemy of David, the one who's causing all this trouble. They have him stuck. He can't get out. He's got all this, uh, you know. It's a famous picture of Absalom. His hair is, uh, is what brought him down. Um, person comes to tell Yoav, I, uh, I saw Absalom and he's stuck in a tree in a, in a, in a, in a lot. And Yoav says, well, why don't you kill him? So he says, what are you, crazy? King David told us not to, uh, not to do that. You know, we're supposed to be protecting the boy, Absalom. I'm, I'm going to go against the king. So Absalom says, all right, you stay here. I got to go take care of business. Remember, this is Absalom. I'm sorry, I keep saying Absalom. Yoav. Yoav sees Absalom. Yoav says, um, I know what the king says, but this is what we have to do. I have to go kill Absalom. Unbelievable. Yoav, by the way, is the same one who kills Avner against the king's advice. Yoav uh, had his own mind and Yoav kind of understood about the story of Uriah. Yoav is a very interesting personality. Um, Absalom takes three, three darts and he sticks in, in uh, I'm sorry, Yoav takes these heart darts and swords or darts or uh, and sticks it in arrows maybe and sticks them in Absalom's heart and another 10 boys come and everyone's kind of stabbing Absalom Nebuch uh, he dies in a, in a terrible way um, and at that point Yoav blows a shofar and that's a sign that the, 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 uh, the battle is over Absalom obviously when your king dies there's no reason to fight anymore so he saved people's lives because as soon as you kill Absalom at yeah, the end of the war they take Absalom they throw him in a pit they put a bunch of stones on, on top of it. It's called the Galavanim, and everyone goes home. In fact, they, 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 they run home because 
there was a civil war and now they are nervous that they're going to be killed. Avshalom, you know, in his lifetime, he had this pillar in the Valley of the King set up for himself. Um, Because he didn't have any sons. So he called this pillar Yad Avshalom until this day. By the way, in Nachal Kidron near the Jerusalem, there is a big um, stone monument called Yad Avshalom, the hand of Avshalom. It's a a later uh, um, cave, but uh, nevertheless. Um, Achimatz, right, wants to run to tell the king of the good news. And Yoav says, that's not wise. You, you don't go on, want to tell this good news. He understood that, that that's not. So he sends a Kushi, a Kushite man, um, and probably not a Jewish, a servant, says, go tell the king what happened. And um, Achimatz was so excited that he runs anyway. He runs and he comes back to the king and, and the king has someone who's guarding the, you know, where he is. And the king says, uh, the guy says to the king, there's someone coming. I says, oh, must be, he's bringing news. And then he sees another person coming. Oh, it's Achimatz, he's bringing good news. And Achimatz comes, he runs ahead of them, tells the story, but he doesn't know because the first question on David's lips are, are is, is my son Avshalom alive? And Achimat seems to not know. And then the Kushite comes and he says, and with great pride, your, uh, your son, the enemy of, of the king is, uh, is dead. God judged him unlike all those who were judged. And, um, and this is the end of the chapter. Now, what do you think David's response is gonna be? Chapter 19, verse one, he is angered. He's shaken, he's crying, he's running, he's tearing his hair out, he's saying, Avshalom b'ni, b'ni Avshalom, ni ten muti, Avshalom b'ni, b'ni. It's a famous line that he just um, can't get Avshalom out of his mind. Uh, he keeps uh, kind of saying, and they said to, to Yoav, hey, listen, the king is just crying all the time on Avshalom. And this is the guy who wanted to kill him. The people don't understand. But maybe they should understand. After all, it's still your son. And the victory that day turned into mourning for all the troops. For that day, the, tr- the king, which should have been you know, so joyous that he's going to be returning to be the king, turns out that he's in mourning. And the troops uh, stole into town that day like ashamed after running away because they, you know, they didn't follow it. And, and the, the king, who just kept saying, B'ni Avshalom, Avshalom, B'ni, B'ni, my son, my son. And we'll stop here. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, wait till uh, next week to find out what's going to happen, how the king is going to deal with this. Thank you very much. And um, have a wonderful day and uh, a good week.